meaningful multilateral cooperation with the African Union and African states, the EU and its member states should focus on listening. African states have their own views on shifts in the global order. The EU should support better representation of African states in multilateral fora and efforts to strengthen African leadership on issues of concern to Africa. Some measures to improve cooperation include supporting meaningful reform of the UN Security Council and taking steps towards substantive engagement with African members. Making the most of this year's Italian G20 presidency to ensure better participation of African actors and to develop an inclusive global economic recovery. Facilitating African vaccine manufacturing capacity, but also working together to strengthen the WHO and the One Health approach over the longer term. Engaging with African countries to formulate a mutually beneficial vision ahead of international climate and environmental negotiations this year. For our collective analysis, read our paper. Chloe Thieven from Brussels. And good morning from my side as well, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this new ETDG event, Beyond Great Powers, the EU Partnership and Inclusive Multilateralism. My name is Vera Mazzara, and I'm the coordinator of the European Think Tanks Group, which is hosting this webinar today. And it's a network of six leading European think tanks based in six European countries, Italy with Istituto Affari Internazionali, France, the French Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, IDRI, UK, ODI, Overseas Development Institute, Netherlands and Belgium with ECDPM, Chloe from ECDPM, um, European Centre for Development Policy Management, Spain, Elcano, and Germany with the German Development Institute. Collectively, we decided to think about how to reinvest, uh, reinvent sorry, and reboost multilateralism. This theme has also been discussed um, with the Commissioner for International Partnerships, Jutta Urpilainen, and our ETDG directors. It's therefore a particular pleasure to have such a high-level panel gathered together today to discuss this theme with us. And I will now leave the floor to Vince Chadwick, who's the Brussels correspondent for DevEx, and will moderate our discussion today. So Vince, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. It's actually great to see everyone. We don't always have the chance to do this in previous webinars where you can see everyone's faces smiling back at you. So it's um, <laughs> welcome, welcome change. I see some familiar faces as well. So thanks for joining us. Um, I'll just briefly introduce our speakers and then we'll get right into the conversation. The only thing I'd mention is we're planning to open up for a kind of final Q&A session around 11.45, but we are keen to hear from you all throughout the conversation. So if you've got a burning question, please let us know uh, in the chat box and we'll try and get to it um, as the as appropriate rather than save all your, your thoughts for the end. Um, so we've got Chloe Steven with us, who's the author of this paper from um, the ECDPM think tank. Uh, we've got Otilia Anna Monganidze, who's the head of special projects at the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria. We've got Daniel Goriev from the DG INPA, um, recently changed its name from DG DEVCO to DG International Partnerships, uh, which is appropriate given uh, this conversation. And we've got Sachin Chaturvede, who is the Director General for the Research and Information Systems for Developing Countries in New Delhi in India. So quite a diverse panel and um, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, Chloe, start with you, and I've got a question that often occurs to me when I read ECDPM uh, papers, which is uh, every week, um, which is when you write something like this um, paper that we're discussing today, uh, who, who's your ideal reader and what do you want them to do as a result? Thank you, Vince. Um, so just to mention that this paper is co-authored with five other authors from the e uh, ETDG network. So those are uh, Daniele Fattibene and Luca Barana from EI, 
and Gabriela Yakubuta, Silke Weinlich, and Stefan Bauer from DIE. Um, so it was a great team, um, and uh, it was it was a very uh, productive um, working experience as part of this ETTG network. Um, I proposed this paper because there had been so much discussion in the past years um, about COVID-19, firstly be with the with kind of the Trump presidency, with the rise of China and the, the increased multi multipolarity, but then also um, because of COVID-19 and this really showed how important multilateral cooperation really was. Um, and yet we weren't in 2020 able to really uh, to really uh, work well together. Um, and a lot of the focus at that point was on how the EU works with um, the US and China in particular. Um, and this paper, which looks really at the EU, Afri at EU Africa cooperation around multilateralism, um, I thought was an interesting way to start to dissect, um, you know, how the EU and Africa work together around multilateralism, um, because this is of increased um, interest with the new Commission. Um, there has been this increased focus on partnership with Africa. Um, and I'd heard many um, EU diplomats and European diplomats from member states mentioning that uh, we should we should do more to partner with Africa at multilateral fora. But it didn't feel like there was a whole lot actually happening in terms of um, you know real steps towards understanding what African positions were in selected international fora and trying to to move those partnerships forward. So this was really, um, yeah, it was really about starting a conversation um, with EU and member state officials about how, you know, what does it actually mean to, to partner with Africa? Is this, because sometimes one gets the impression that um, the EU has a very strong stance on multilateralism and has strong wants to uphold current principles and values. And yet, in order to create partnerships, you really need to negotiate and build uh, build common understandings. Um, and that's really what this paper tried to get at. So, um, I, I might uh, ask Daniel uh, then um, to to weigh in on the EU's contribution, which is the uh, recent communication on the same uh, on the same topic. So, as as while well, Chloe was was hearing these kind of things as well, the Commission's also been thinking about this, and it came out with its recent communication on multilateralism. Um, could you perhaps explain a little bit for us about what what the main main takeaways are we should we should take from that document, please? Uh, yes, Vince, you can hear me all. Yeah, th thanks a lot. So, um, I mean, most of you know, but maybe you do not know that, as Vince referred, that um, back in mid-February, the, the Commission came up with a communication, which is our jargon for, a, let's say, a new policy document. So, joint communication by, by the Commission and our uh, uh, colleagues um, from the External Action Service and our, our high representative about, uh, let's say, the EU multilateral ambition. Um, and uh, that paper preceded, uh, I think, the, the one that Vera uh, just presented by, by a month or so. Um, and in many ways is the, the EU ambition, the EU vision uh, for the years ahead uh, in the multilateral system. Uh, the timing of it was, I think, quite interesting because it came just um, in the aftermath of the uh, new uh, uh, U.S. Uh, president taking function. And in a way, uh, that by itself, I think, was a signal that, yes, we were very happy to have our U.S. friends uh, back in the multilateral game. And since then, we've, we've seen that the Americans have stepped up their multilateral engagement. But we've also uh, basically signaled through that communication that um, Europe has its own ambition. We are no, we don't want to be naive. Uh, we think we can lead uh, multilateral conversations, that we can create alliances, we can create partnerships. Um, and there's, Vince alluded to it, but there's a whole uh, change of philosophy inside the union about it. 
um, and that therefore we need to equip ourselves with a, a more strategic long-term vision of, of that what, what it takes and what it implies. Uh, it's clearly not a strategy you deploy overnight. It's, it's, it's a long-term um, uh, game plan, so to speak. Uh, it relies on uh, well, us uh, determining quite clearly what, what are our priorities uh, in the multilateral uh, setting, what kind of universal, let's say, agendas uh, we back. Uh, it also implies um, that we strengthen a bit our own uh, internal coherence because, well, uh, we are a co complex machinery, as, as you all know, uh, and it takes uh, uh, a lot sometimes to go in the same direction. But once we manage, we can uh, we can really make uh, uh, things uh, things move and uh, shape many conversations. And of course, there's there's a strong uh, angle about partnerships and alliance building. And my own new department in the Commission, so DG INTPA, which is the uh, uh, short abbreviation for international partnerships, is symbolic of that. So we are no longer the, the Director General of the Commission for for development, but partnerships. Uh, and and there, the logic is to say, look, uh, development by itself is just um, no. It's, it's anecdotical almost. What we need is um, to link much better uh, some of the internal priorities that we have in Europe with, with our external action. Uh, and it's about creating a, a quality conversation with partners that uh, ultimately uh, we can bring in um, a difference together. And of course, there's money underlying behind it, but money is almost anecdotical. Uh, not totally, but but it's meant to be a catalyzer for uh, for, for for quality, uh, let's say, uh, partnerships ahead. So so that's uh, in a very let's say uh, uh, buzz buzz manner a bit uh, uh, what this multilateralism communication about is about. From a European perspective, it would, it's of course also accompanied as those of you who follow the Brussels scene by lots of um, debates discussions uh, about Europe's capacity to have. Uh, uh, strategic autonomy. So, therefore, uh, when when we cannot go multilateral, what is the fallback option? Uh, uh, we are um, we are let's say a regulatory power, and we think that uh, 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 we have the capacity to shape many many uh, conversations uh, based on that. Uh, in tandem with with many others who uh, we hope. Uh, have similar uh, visions inspired by some of the universal agendas out there, be it Paris, be it the 2030 agenda, uh, be it human rights, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, I bring um, Ottilia in, if, if I may, because I, I'm really keen to hear what, what you, uh, what comes to mind when you listen to this new Elan that Brussels is talking about, um, uh, uh, trying to bring to its relationship with Africa. I mean, I, and I'm thinking of three three things myself. First is the attempted meeting between um, the European leaders, Charles Michel, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, Angela Merkel, and I believe Emmanuel Macron last year, which was cancelled at less than 24 hours notice, but on by the Af African Union side, um, saying that there was a scheduling problem, but. I mean, as I said to people, I don't think you I don't think you block an hour in Angela Merkel's agenda and then cancel 24 hours before because of a scheduling problem. It seemed like there was some kind of diplomatic game going on there as well, which made me question when we talk about this new partnership, how how strong is it really? Are, are the two sides really talking in a in a significant way? Um, and another thing that comes to mind when we, we talk about this um, in, in Brussels, at least, is the Cotonou Agreement. Um, which is an, obviously an agreement between the EU or the EU parties with a little asterisk about who the agreement is from on the EU side um, and the 79 African Caribbean Pacific countries, which is a big multilateral endeavour, but some say it's so broad that it's almost meaningless is often the criticism that's that's levelled at, at the Cotonou Agreement. Um, so they're, the, they're some of the things that I'm, I keep in mind when we hear about Brussels attempts to build this new relationship and, I, and then Sometimes you, you wonder what it, what it really means in practice. Um, what do you think when you listen to, to um, Daniel and Chloe outline their, their vision? 
Um, thanks a lot for that. And I think uh, quite provocative in, 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 in getting right out um, uh, with the conversation. So first, it's, it's extremely difficult, uh, in fact, near impossible to have a conversation about the relationship between Africa and Europe or Africa and the EU um, without obviously acknowledging the history of that relationship um, and, and, and some of the, the, the challenges that come with that. So often for me, uh, whether it's a, a new pact uh, dealing with specific issues of migration or asylum, or whether it's communications that frame more broadly what is a repackaged development cooperation into international partnerships, the, the question that always comes to mind is the extent to which there were consultations prior to, uh, to, to reaching that agreement or, or that position and the role um, actively, so to speak, of African member states within that process. It can become a bit difficult, uh, let me be quite blunt, where it's a conversation between the European Union, which is a far more established body with various institutions uh, uh, as its foundation and buttressing it, um, and the African Union, which remains largely a member state driven uh, process with uh, an African Union Commission that is capacitated, but not at the same level as the European Union is. So when speaking of partnerships, it becomes a question of whether this is a partnership of equals, not only in terms of numbers, but really in terms of institutional uh, strength and might. And so uh, when, uh, when, for example, you, you cite the example of a last minute cancellation of a meeting, uh, for me, that doesn't always seem bizarre. That being said, it doesn't take away from the supposition or assumptions that perhaps it was on the part of the African Union or some African member states uh, playing um, a game of politics with, with the European Union. It doesn't take that away, but it, it doesn't also suggest that it's not possible that there can be a scheduling conflict um, uh, simply because the, the, the Chancellor of Germany is one of the people that, that's, uh, that's part of the meeting um, doesn't necessarily nullify the, 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 the reason. Now, when it comes to, and you spoke about uh, post-Cotonou or the Cotonou Agreement, um, also the EU-Africa uh, partnership um, and multiple bilateral and multilateral arrangements between the European Union, but also with individual member states of the African Union. Um, just by saying that alone, I'm a bit overwhelmed um, that there are so many different arrangements between the European Union, between the European Commission, between individual European countries and African Union, the uh, African Union member states, and regional economic mechanisms and communities. And so in my mind, and I'll end on this because I think it's an ongoing conversation that we're having, in my mind, there is a need to rationalize the different uh, arrangements into a partnership. So it's not to take away the different arrangements. It's to say there has to be a single overarching partnership that informs engagement. The 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 main hole, if you can call it that way, uh, into the various side arrangements that can be there. Without that main hole, so to speak, it does open itself up for disparate arrangements. It also opens itself up for um, disagreement uh, between individual African member states, the African Union itself, and then the European Union and its member states. You're essentially dealing with uh, almost, what, 82 different uh, uh, countries that are meant to be working under two bodies. But fundamentally, if you do not have an overarching arrangement that allows for that, it does open itself up for um, sometimes the, the mess and muddle in which we find ourselves. So that um, 
Sachin, I'm keen to get get your take on all of this as, as well in a second, but I just wanted to go back to some, um, that, um, pick up on that point and come back to Chloe, because in your paper, or you and your colleagues' paper, as you point out, um, you mentioned that the African Union is currently developing a vision for Africa's international partnerships, including a strategy for relations with global and regional partners and regional blocs such as the EU. Is that the hall that Otilia is talking about? Well, I think Otilia would be better able to answer that question than I. Um, but our paper does also very much uh, acknowledge the fact that even when it comes to the EU, when it comes to multilateralism specifically, which is what we're talking about today, that um, that often it is the EU member states that have um, ultimately, when it comes to the UN Security Council, for example, it is the EU member states, just like it is the AU member states that are actually represented at the table. And therefore, that when it comes to a continental partnership, you do need to work through the member states. Um, so that's just in response to what Otilia was just saying, that I do think that um, it's very important to pay attention to the role of the member states. Um, and when it comes to foreign policy, that is also incredibly important on the EU side. In other areas, such as regulation, the EU certainly has a lot more um, uh, has a, a lot more clout than the AUC does, where even that needs to be done through a more intergovernmental uh, approach. Um, but when it comes to foreign policy, to a great extent on both continents, there is a great deal of intergovernmentalism. Um, and while we can have strategies such as, you know, the EU now has this multilateralism strategy that uh, Daniel was speaking about, um, ultimately it is up to the member states to follow through on that strategy. Um, and so that, that, you know, certainly on the AU side, there has been a, a, an increased um, you know, there has been this increased movement towards seeing the Af seeing African agency as being um, as being something that can be better achieved by working together, by developing joint positions, and we've really seen that at international fora, like at the UN Security Council, where the African states have increasingly worked together and have increasingly um, tried to to put forward common positions um, and to, to coordinate coordinate as well with the African Union PSC in order to ensure that, that they have strong positions that are backed up by the entire continent. Um, so certainly the international partnership strategy will be uh, an important step forward in this regard in terms of, um, I, I believe it will look to streamline uh, Africa's relationships with external partners such as the EU, such as China, such as um, the US um, in future. Um Daniel, I might I might bring you in, uh, in there as well and, and ask a, a joint question to you and Otilia, since we're, we're talking about member states um, and something that occurs to me in these conversations is we can go a long way without ever mentioning any precise countries <laughs> and any precise people. <laughs> and this is one of my battles sometimes when we cover the DG for international partnerships. Who are your key partners in your mind? Um, people, personality, Wise. Who and a question to Otilia as well, who do you see on the African side as those who are most buying in and engaging with uh, Europe as, as it um, tries to reach out in this in this new new way in the last few years? I come in. Um, I mean, difficult things to, to to nail it down to people, because I think if you if you I mean, depends if we're talking multilateral partnerships or, let's say, partnerships for multilateral issues. Um, and there, many of your interlocutors uh, risk risk varying. But I think it's extremely difficult because it's so multifaceted. It it, it ranges from, uh, uh, you know, perm reps in uh, permanent representatives in New York talking to each other to uh, us partnering uh, with a given minister following um, green climate issues or or economy uh, in Africa or elsewhere uh, and, and becoming, let's say, our interlocutor of choice uh, uh, to work in practice following probably a wider political uh, ideally validation at, at, at heads of state uh, uh, level very often. Um, of course, that being said, 
you also notice that when um, uh, when certain conversations and even you know uh, events get shaped, often there is a propensity or tendency to to invite uh, some some of those you know, uh, uh, some of those with whom uh, the conversation has reached a, a certain uh, maturity level, or in certain cases on our uh, on our side, I think when there's a perception that somebody is a bit of a champion on a specific issue, let's say on the on the African continent, and is therefore also a, a, a like-minded uh, like-minded ally. Uh, but I think you, we would need to pick the issue, and we would need to then disaggregate to to answer your question. Okay. Um... Green energy. Uh, I'm not the specialist on green, green energy, but I I, I think uh, uh, we, we know that uh, let's say if if you take the African continent, some uh, some countries have really embraced uh, a bit of a of a green vision, green, green agenda, uh, and uh, uh, we've had also uh, specific institutions also behind it. So we have the uh, uh, the, the the array platform, for instance, on energy, where historically we've been very engaged. Uh, there's been a, a set of uh, African partners in there, um, and very often the conversations have built uh, have built on that. Uh, now, uh, in New York, there'll be specific high, high level dialogue on energy, as we know, uh, in the margins of UNGA. So some of those interlocutors with whom we've built some of these regional or or uh, uh, country conversations, I think uh, we will see how uh, uh, how we're capable to together have a coherent discourse in New York, for instance, uh, uh, in September and in the run up to the to the COP and some of the uh, let's say green related happenings uh, in the year to come. Okay, um, Otilia, what about you? Who do you see as the main uh, leaders on the African continent who are taking up this this uh, partnership dynamic? Uh, thanks for that. Uh, by not naming any names, Daniel's made my, my job a bit easier because then I don't have to. Um, but, you know, a week or so ago, the G7 leaders uh, met um, the only African country that was part of those discussions uh, was South Africa. South Africa also happens to be the only country that is part of the group of 20 uh, countries and um, is meant to attend not only as South Africa, but also uh, on behalf of the African continent and to speak back and report back on some of the key issues discussed, whether it's issues around vaccination, whether it's issues around um, uh, climate change or peace and security. The presumption is that uh, South Africa does this in its individual capacity as South Africa, but also does so as, as a Southern African uh, and African country. That's not to say that South Africa is my immediate pick in terms of the, the, the country that should be um, uh, spearheading certain discussions. We know that the African Union is headquartered in Addis Ababa. We also know that the AU Commission chairperson is from Chad, that countries like Morocco um, have desert as their, 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 their you know, the, the majority of their, of their geography is, 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 is desert land where solar energy is being harnessed. We know that from the European side, countries like Denmark, for example, are pushing and promoting ways of using renewable energy or that France, Germany, the Netherlands have always historically and at present been uh, leaders in terms of discussions around peace and security um, on the African continent. These aren't secrets uh, by any measure. These are countries that have been involved uh, uh, on the African continent and on the African side, these are countries that have involved themselves in conversations related to the relationship between Africa and the EU. But, and I go back to numbers, Africa is a continent of 55 countries. 54 of those are member states of the African Union. 
Europe on its part now, since it's 27 um, member states or, or, or those that are party to the European Union, but it also engages with a number of countries that are not part of the European Union that themselves um, simply by, by, by geography have to have a relationship with, with their neighboring countries and the neighboring regions. So it's not going to be easy. Let me, let me be quite frank. It is never going to be easy to have a single relationship between 55 countries on the one side, 27 plus on the other, which is why having it at institutional level and not making it about people, but making it about institutions matters. So no names, but countries and countries that can lead on certain issues have to be in the room and have to be at the table. And they have to be seated at the table, not being served on the table. And I think that's very important when we speak about the relationship between Europe and Africa. So let's have equals speaking to and with each other at the table and, and let it be through the existing institutions, because sometimes the, the, the individualization of issues complicates it. Thank you very much. Um, Sachin, since we were talking about South Africa, that made me think about the infamous TRIPS waiver, which is interesting when we talk about the EU and multilateralism, of course, because, you know, a lot of the dynamic has been about listening, what do global partners want, joint position in international forum. And when it comes to COVID and intellectual property and the TRIPS waiver, the EU's basically said nothing for a long time. And then when they had to say something, they said, this is not the South African proposal is, is not the, the way forward. We're going to come up with a, a ambiguous third way. Um, and so I wonder, you know, given all of the drama in India recently with COVID, and I hope you and yours are well, and um, I you know, would we appreciate personally an update about what the situation is like there as well at the moment. Um, do you think when you look at the past year and the way the EU's behaved during the COVID crisis, has it helped or hindered the way the EU's, the, the EU's credibility when it comes to multilateralism? I mean, and just preface that with one more point that, that sitting in Brussels, the EU, we received a torrent of press releases about all of the funding that was going to COVAX. And then we ended up in a situation uh, at a vaccine equity summit uh, with uh, President von der Leyen a few weeks ago, where all of the wealthy countries stood around and said, oh, this is terrible. There's no vaccines. What are, what are we going to do? But they, they bought them all up, basically. So how, what is, what do you, what's your vision on, on that sitting where, where you're sitting and whether the past year has helped or hindered um, the EU's global status when it makes these kind of calls for a new multilateralism? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Vanessa. And I think at the outset, I must uh, uh, congratulate uh, uh, the ETTG group for uh, this very stimulating paper. And thanks to you for this question on, uh, on TRIPS waiver. A couple of points I would like to make at the outset. And, and I think uh, uh, first and foremost, of course, uh, is uh, a consistent EU commitment in terms of uh, uh, supporting and partnering the uh, developing countries. and. Uh, and uh, enabling them to cope up with the crisis. That goes without saying, and I think uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a major uh, uh, contribution. So, so that, that goes without saying. The uh, point about TRIPS waiver, I think uh, you are right. Uh, in the beginning, we did not hear much. And uh, when the EU proposal at the WTO has come in, uh, uh, the idea is something which uh, uh, EU had never earlier uh, uh, articulated in that way is about the position on compulsory licensing. And, and uh, 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 once if you see uh, a compulsory licensing has its own challenges, it has its own limitations, and uh, it uh, uh, proposes its own impediments. At my institute at RIS, uh, uh, for last four Saturdays, I am holding uh, global discussions. We had the global panel with South Center in Geneva and a couple of uh, global experts on trips. Then we went to Africa. We partnered with uh, uh, several institutions, including SIA and IGD in, uh, in Pretoria, and then uh, to Latin America, where uh, 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 Andre and all uh, our dear friends from LATEM could, uh, could join. And now this uh, Saturday, we are holding discussions with ASEAN countries, how they view TRIPS waiver. And across the globe, we are realizing that uh, 
uh, the compulsory licensing, the position that EU has taken in the WTO paper, it says that you should go for compulsory licensing and not for TRIPS waiver. The trouble is, uh, the moment you go for compulsory licensing, you can't export. Now, you can't give this a condition to Ghana, which has no production capacity. So you have to have it with some countries which have the production capacity. Uh, in the India-Brazil-South Africa partnership, IPSA, uh, we suggested Brazil and South Africa to, uh, to partner, strengthen production capacities and take the idea forward in terms of how we are addressing uh, uh, the production capacities. But if we do not uh, have the wherewithals, and imagine the countries that do not have, uh, and that's why the whole question of vaccine uh, inequity that, that is coming in, the whole question of access, equity, inclusion with vaccines is, is somewhere out in the air. And EU has been the one which was taking principled positions when it always came to health issues. The idea of equity, the idea of global justice, the idea of inclusion were the principles with which EU stood. What happened with the TRIPS waiver? And that's the question I want to raise at this platform. What happened with the TRIPS waiver? And, and that's the way I, I feel uh, uh, that the idea of compulsory licensing and, and uh, even uh, uh, bringing in the quantity restrictions that compulsory licensing brings in, we should do away with it. And, and the implication of this is uh, even with G7's uh, clear mandate in terms of uh, 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 bringing vaccine to everyone, the tax-based negotiations at WTO have come to a standstill because the proposal of EU has really polarized. And now the South Africa, India proposal, which has support of 60 least developed countries and developing countries uh, uh, and emerging economies, we are finding it difficult to go forward. And this is when uh, the strongest uh, supporter of TRIPS, uh, uh, the, the United States has come forward in terms of uh, uh, supporting the waiver. Of course, with several caveats, which uh, 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 even France uh, supported, but, but you see the position that Germany has taken and Germany's uh, spillover effect on EU's position has uh, brought in open the, the cliff that we are seeing uh, within uh, the bloc. And, and, and we are so grateful to, to France for uh, so clearly articulating this position just before uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the Convil uh, uh, meets that we had of the G7. So I think it is important for us to see how the TRIPS waiver could have actually strengthened production capacities. And this, Vince, is very much related to the other question that this uh, excellent paper raises is in terms of localization of development, reducing the carbon footprint, reducing the excessive trade that we have ended up. Africa cannot be export destination. Africa has to be investment destination. And if you recall contribution of Germany as German presidency of G20, Germany was all for investment for Africa. Now was the opportunity before Germany to support uh, IMF's $100 billion proposal of investment, and we could have strengthened and created vaccine production capacities in Africa. We cannot and no longer should continue with lip service to Africa. We need to see how these investments are going to go forward. And we need to see if IMF is supporting, if technology is available, put your waiver, put waiver of two years or, or whatever months you are thinking of but give them the facility and we could have achieved the global target of universal vaccination. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I might give, give Daniel a chance to respond. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in particular about the, the recently announced Team Europe initiative of 1 billion euros to support local manufacturing of vaccines in Africa. Unfortunately, it's not clear to me, I don't think where that money is coming from, where it's going and with who, who is implementing it. Um, and, you know, when we talk about too many um, attempts at, at organisation, I mean, when I, I was struck when I saw this Team Europe initiative announced, and then a few days later I saw that um, IFC and Propaco had teamed up on some local manufacturing, and I said to the Commission, I said, well, surely this is part of your Team Europe initiative, and they said, oh, no, actually, this is complementary. So, 
I don't understand how Proparco, which is the French agency, can then go off separately. And and are these African, presumably, um, not a vast amount of potential manufacturing sites are going to be inundated with offers from different global funders, including in the case of Europe and the same continent, without proper coordination. So that was one question I had um, in this context as well. But Daniel, I thought you might like to come in on, on the TRIPS waiver and some of the other points that Sachin raised. Yeah, no, of course, I mean, that's that's not my realm of work uh, daily, so to speak, but you know the EU position and let's say our starting point, which is um, towards a bit of a comprehensive approach and that is based, let's say, on the immediate uh, situation and the fact that we want uh, things to happen fast rather than, um, you know, a bit like the US did declare something that is very appealing, but from a, uh, a design and immediate implementation perspective is, is, not, uh, is not immediately realistic. Uh, um, uh, based also, let's say, on, on our credentials, uh, which I don't think we should, as Europeans, totally shy from uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of months. Also, by the way, together with India, uh, but also others as being a bit the pharmacy of the world, because if you look at uh, you know, the manufacturing capacity in Europe, uh, half of it has been uh, uh, on vaccine has been going going outside Europe in, I think, over over 19 or, or, or so countries. Um, so we have been trying to play uh, a truly multilateral role with the constraints that we know uh, uh, insufficient uh, uh, insufficient capacity. Does this link also to uh, uh, the immediate priority of boosting manufacturing capacity uh, and the announcement that, that you referred to, uh, which is a Team Europe approach, Team Europe initiative. So for those that are maybe not familiar, this is our new, uh, I mean, maybe we can come back to that, but this is our new way of uh, trying to come up with solutions on scale. Uh, starting with the European Union, but of course trying to expand as much as possible uh, to all uh, EU 27 member states that might be active in a given field, and of course then uh, generating partnerships around it. So this first billion, that is something that was announced just based on the EU layer, not yet the member states layer. Uh, therefore, we are trying yet to, uh, to, uh, to make the connection uh, with our member states because it's complex. At the same time, we are talking to to the likes of the IF, IFC, who, as we know, of course, have have the best uh, uh, the best uh, 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 among the best experiences on on manufacturing uh, 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 out there and uh, working with the private sector. And of course, looking, I mean, coming back on you know priority countries for priority topics, uh, you know what what. A bit like Otila was saying on on green. Obviously, we know where the immediate potential capacity in Africa, for instance, is based on uh, on what exists and partnerships that we might have had. It's of course uh, South Africa. It is uh, it is Senegal, uh, and uh, therefore some of the priority uh, conversations have been happening. Uh, happening there. But yes, as Europe, we of course try to approach this comprehensively. There's the licensing uh, uh, conversation now ongoing, uh, of course, in Geneva, in the WTO uh, uh, TRIPS context. There's the exports uh, uh, restrictions conversation that uh, uh, that needs to be dealt with because uh, it is still an issue in many, uh, in many countries. In Europe, we have, uh, we have been um, Overall, uh, as we know, generous on it, and then the manufacturing aspect that that, that you just alluded to. Uh, those three taken together are part of the, let's say, uh, faster, uh, faster probably capacity to deliver to deliver uh, solutions rather than going into multi-year uh, conversations that list blocking uh, uh, something that is absolutely paramount for for global health and global recovery. Uh, in the coming months, um, and I think uh, yes, uh, the the trips uh, sort of waiver thing has been divisive, but at least the signals from the latest G7 have been, I think, overall quite positive, and uh, uh, hopefully some of the uh, uh, developed nations out there are, 
are indeed stepping up, stepping up efforts as as we've seen. I'm I'm conscious of of time, and I remind our our audience to please drop your your questions um, to to our panelists as well, and we'll we'll get to them um, as as soon as we can. Uh, Chloe, I wanted to to come back to you um, on this point about um, vaccines and perhaps some of the things that you're calling for in your paper, because one of um, one of the things I heard perhaps a year ago when there was this constant uncertainty about when the famous EU-AU summit would be held um, that uh, is being postponed um, many times now because of, um, of, course of the pandemic. I would hear from people in the Brussels and Commission and say, look, if we don't get vaccine equity right, if we don't get enough doses to our African partners, then we will have zero credibility to sit down and talk about multilateralism, a common agenda, um, and all the other things that you, you discuss in your paper uh, at the at the EU Africa summit, that um, it'll be it, the the emperor will be wearing no clothes, and Western self interest will have won out, and uh, the whole thing will become a farce. That was basically the concern. And so, I wanted to ask you, if in your view, when that conversation does happen, can the EU hold its head, head up high and say that it's been the pharmacy for the world, or will there be some awkward moments about the fact that we're vaccinating 12 year olds in Belgium where the vaccination rates remain so low in the rest of the world? Well, yes, I do think this comes back to the, the, the root of this whole new approach to Africa um, and also to this idea of the geopolitical commission, um, because ultimately I would say that um, there's certainly this. There's certainly a very strong moral argument, which Sachin has already laid out, but also just in terms of kind of strategic communication, which um, this commission has really been pushing to be better on strategic communication, to be more geopolitical, to um, to to not only to to show how its interests and its values um, stand side by side. And yet, ultimately, in terms of, um, it comes across with, with much of the communication around the vaccine question that the EU is, is sort of making, is making arguments that are not very understandable to common, uh, to, you know, the, the wider public that are that are quite complex and quite technical instead of uh, like Biden actually supporting uh, the vaccine waiver, supporting what developing countries actually asked for, as opposed to saying, no, but we can give you something else which is actually better than what you've asked for. Um, so, so in terms of the, the communication there, I think there's really a problem in terms of how the, the, the EU has been um, communicating on this. Um, uh, if, as uh, the, 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 the argument is that this TRIPS waiver would not be the most effective way, but, but surely in terms of if it's, if it's, if it's still, you know, Surely, if it's not going to actually have the impact, maybe you sh should still actually support it and also do the other things um, rather than saying, but instead we'll give you something else. Um, but so I feel that there's there's very much this 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 communication problem when it comes to how the EU is actually uh, um, speaking about this. Um, but uh, it's actually my, my colleague, uh, Daniele Fertibene, who wrote the, the whole section on, um, on health um, and on vaccines, um, and who maybe at a later point could come in on that. Maybe point. I, saw, so, I saw Daniele's on the call, and Daniele, I hope you're not there screaming at your computer waiting for me to ask a question or anything like that. If you wanted to come in, perhaps now is the time. So, shall I? Shall I? Well, I think that, um, as you repeatedly said uh, during the webinar, uh, uh, the pandemic showed that the cooperation on multilateral, multilateral cooperation on health was crucial. Uh, Daniel Giorov said many times that uh, some of these responsibilities go beyond uh, the EU ones, uh, and it's more and it's very crucial to see how intergovernmentalism will uh, uh, support or actually slow down this process of ensuring a stronger 
manufacturing capabilities in Africa or uh, wearing uh, uh, the trips uh, or patents. Um, the thing is that uh, the communication of multilateralism uh, was very good in raising the level of ambition of the EU also in these topics. And uh, it is uh, important to say that on health, uh, Africa and the EU uh, cooperated well uh, since uh, last year. But uh, it is crucial that all the actors that are playing a key role in this, so single member states, uh, multilateral organizations, uh, uh, regional organizations are all in line to ensure that uh, the pandemic uh, hit, does not hit any more on the most vulnerable. Uh, now we see that nationalism and vaccines distribution has won already, so we need to revert that um, uh, very soon. Uh, because uh, as we always uh, repeat and say, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And I think that the crucial bottleneck is really to boost uh, manufacturing capabilities. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of commitments and pledges also from the AU side on this uh, in terms of uh, development of uh, um, uh, R&D and structures to develop uh, uh, new vaccines, uh, technologies like the uh, messenger RNA uh, vaccines. So I think we all need to play uh, hard on that. And we as research community and also as, uh, let's say, good advocates uh, should, uh, you know, support these arguments because uh, this is uh, really crucial and uh, uh, the spread of more than 700 variants uh, of COVID uh, all over the world uh, testifies that we're, it's not uh, over yet. We are seeing the, uh, the end uh, of the tunnel, but we really need to work as Europeans to ensure that health is the very first sector where these it in relation uh, takes place. Um, thanks, Dan Daniele. And um, and Daniel, I, I'm also I, I would say that we appreciate your your presence, and I'd, I'd hate for you to feel like a punching bag for everyone's frustrations about everything to do with the EU and, and multilateralism, because it's it, it we can come across sometimes as 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 critical and finding all of the shortcomings. But I think you know, going back to Chloe's point about you know with the trips waiver and um, this idea that we're oh, we're not going to try that, we're going to do something else. Part of what was so difficult for me to understand about that was that COVAX itself was such a bold experiment that at one hand the EU was trying to say look we can do something unprecedented here on the other hand it was saying that's no we're not going to even try that 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 created some cognitive dissonance um for me we've got we've got a question coming in um from B Bernardo Ivo, Ivo Cruz who wants to ask about private sector and sustainable development which is one of my favorite topics as well um and I uh, perhaps Bernardo I, I could I could give you the floor, but before I do, I just wanted to, um, uh, that reminded me of something that the Portuguese presidency said on development uh, a couple of, when they passed some um, relatively, un, well, didn't get a lot of attention, but they passed some council conclusions on human development. And the state secretary said, it's time to go back to basics. Um, these, you know, health and education are what people need in, in some of our partner countries. And uh, we might've strayed too far into, I, into the realm of, you know, he didn't say this, but you might argue budget guarantees and some kind of novel instruments and things. Um, really, the, the bread and butter of development it, it still has a has a role. Um, and it's obviously quite contested when we talk about um, private sector um, and its role in sustainable development. It was um, it was interesting to see that role, that um, comment coming from the the, the Portuguese uh, presidency, and it, it's something that that I think about a lot as well. I mean, Daniel, you you know, you said at the beginning that. Um, it's not, it's not about the money in some ways. Um, and you know, that you're going, going to EU is going for a more partnership of equals, but my thought on that sometimes is that the, the most, what the best way to treat someone as an equal is to talk about the money <laughs> is to treat it as a, is to talk like adults about the finance. Whereas if you entered into a, a partnership with someone, which was basically based on hundreds of millions of euros changing hands and then the first thing he said was oh well we don't want to talk about the money that in itself might be seen as paternalistic um as is sometimes a, a thought that, that occurs to me but um bernardo um I'll, I'll hand over to you if you'd like to answer your question um uh in person given that you've you've teased it in the chat thank you thank you so much uh vincent and thank you to all the speakers it's been very very interesting um uh i'm I'm a former uh, board member of the Portuguese Sustainable Development Agency or uh, institution. So we've been working 
for many, many years now on the role of private sector in sustainable development. And I would like to ask two questions that are connected one to the other. One is, is the, uh, the way that Europe uh, and, and uh, Africa talk about the same issues using different language. Uh, which for me it's it's always a problem uh, and and I find it uh, difficult um, because we use different different words uh, and different language to 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 talk about basically the same thing and I wonder if we shouldn't um, use common language and agreed language on base of the sustainable development goals to address the same issues that we are talking. Uh, for instance, uh, in Europe, we talk about the green agenda. Uh, when we have a, a full range of sustainable development goals agreed by the, the, the United Nations and the United Nations member states, uh, that talk about the same thing. Shouldn't we try to find a common language for common issues uh, that would allow us to overcome some uh, difficulties uh, in, in understanding. Uh, in particular, because if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, you will find that you have, working as, as a, a, a nexus, uh, economic growth, social development, environmental sustainability, good governance, which are all key uh, elements for a partnership between Europe and Africa. Uh, and then I would like to add uh, the financial instruments for development and the role of private sector. Uh, we, uh, we've been uh, pushing for, for, for many years now uh, for private sector to take a, a role in, in sustainable development and uh, development itself. Uh, and the, the, the argument is it's very, it's very simple. Um, on one hand, um, public, the public purse is not enough to fulfill the ambitions of the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. There's a, a gap of around $5 trillion a year. Uh, it was less before the pandemic, is more now, so let's settle around the $5 trillion. Uh, on the other hand, um, job creation, investment that leads to job creation, uh, it's, it's not only good for the people who get jobs, but it's also good for the countries where that investment is, is made because they then can raise taxes, uh, pay for public policies, et cetera, et cetera. But the role, we have to understand what is the role of private sector. Private sector have to make money. They have to have a, a return on their investment. Uh, if not, they're not private sector, they're something else. And they will not survive without a return on the investment. Uh, which means that we have also to have a, a very serious and long conversation about good governance in both sides. Uh, and how can we create the best environment for private, for the good private investment that we're talking about, the private investment that uh, brings new jobs, that brings a transfer of technology, uh, that generates income that can be then translated into taxes paid in the countries where that private investment is made. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, my question uh, is, uh, do we need a new um, conversation, uh, a shared conversation uh, around concepts uh, and ideas that we all recognize, uh, both in Europe and Africa, uh, uh, which I would argue is the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2030 or the Agenda 2063 uh, uh, for the African Union. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ortelia, would you like to, to take a stab at answering that one and then perhaps others can circle back in their concluding remarks? Uh, thanks, Vince, and I'll try to be quite uh, brief in responding to, to the issues rather than the, rather than the question. Um, so first, it is about this um, commonality of language. Um, and Bernardo has spoken to, you know, the existence of common language, at least at international level. And I think one of the main issues really has to do with what we're discussing today, which is um, the need to speak with each other, to consult before uh, the, the, the issuance of, of positions or, or, or statements so that there can be some consistency. Um, so three C's, if you can, communication, consultation and consistency, right? And I think 
it's not just about language because in so much time speaking uh, semantics, it's not just about language, it's really about the, the actual uh, practice of it as well. And it is about agreeing on, on key points. So maybe sometimes people use different words to say the same thing because there's a lack of agreement on a particular principle or on the way in which it needs to be actioned. Um, which then which then brings in the private sector in the earlier conversation that you 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 were having now about the trips waiver um you know there was quite a bit in terms of the distinction between the eu eu member states and the private sector as if these three levels of engagement don't have to work together especially in the conversations that we're having it's not just about vaccines it's about infrastructural development. It's about access to healthcare and education. It's a range of issues for which neither of these entities work on their own, not really anyway, and not in practice. And even as and when a, a, a European or other private sector actor engages in Africa, their primary uh, um, interlocutor is often the state. The, the entity that gives them the clearance to be able to, to, to work, even before they get into the communities and work on the ground. And so I do think there has to be a way in which we, we push for more of these kinds of conversations, but with all the actors involved. It can't be that the EU and Africa have a conversation, let's say on the green economy, for example, uh, or on uh, or a just transition without shell in the room, without the, the entities that are partly or almost wholly responsible for why it is we have to have a conversation about a green transition or uh, a conversation on peace and security without um, uh, private security or, uh, or or mercenaries, depending on who's speaking, that are involved and engaged on the African continent. So I think the exclusion of the, the, the private sector um, in the main whole, if I can go back to that analogy, is perhaps at our own peril. And I think we have to have the conversations in a way that doesn't say this is a private sector conversation and this is a public sector conversation, because in reality and in practice, uh, a lot of the engagement is across the different sectors and it is and it does involve um, a, a, a lot of different actors. I'll end there because it is 12.04 and I know we've only got 26 minutes left. That's right. Thank you very much. I I'm, I'm wanted to ask uh, Sachin for his thoughts on that and um, touch, perhaps touching on some of Daniele's points that he raised in the chat in your questions, in his questions to you as well, Sachin, about the, what the EU can do to support more um, these conversations, even South-South uh, cooperation as well. I think uh, that's uh, that's a very relevant uh, reference point and, and, and I think it uh, uh, provides uh, 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 quite a sort of substance when we are uh, uh, trying to connect with countries when it comes to supply of uh, uh, vaccine, both uh, uh, as a short term measure, as we heard, Daniel, and, and also uh, uh, in terms of uh, how medium to long term measures uh, may come in. And as uh, uh, Otalia has very rightly said, we need to uh, uh, bring forward the local demand and local uh, uh, concerns that are there. And I think Claire uh, was al also equally correct that uh, uh, the consistency has to come in in terms of how over the years we have seen uh, uh, the nature of demand and also uh, the patterns which are uh, which are absolutely clear. So uh, the crux now here is to uh, uh, quickly get uh, whatever has to be given, but but I, I see no uh, respite in terms of uh, 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 we compromising on the production capacity. So I think uh, uh, the the focus on on local production capacity there is no uh, sort of shortcut to that. It has to be strengthened. The pandemic has given us an opportunity, and we should go forward. And there are EU initiatives that are there, and and. Uh, uh, some of us who have participated in FP7 and other uh, FP6 even, I have been participating uh, them for many, many years now. 
uh, I think uh, it adds to huge value on uh, science, technology, innovation, and science, technology, society connect. And that uh, is EU's strength. And, and uh, I think uh, 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 Claude was equally right that uh, EU has also failed in terms of communication, despite of uh, doing so much in terms of how international cooperation and international development partnership is taking a shape. And, and sometimes it gets eclipsed in the individual members' uh, rush, but as we heard, uh, uh, Team EU probably is going to uh, get more uh, sort of amplified. But I think uh, uh, the, the uh, EU as an entity probably requires this at multiple levels. And, and, and first and foremost, with the TRIPS waiver debate, uh, the uh, stand that has been taken for quite long, there was no word at all. And people were wondering, the, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, the press conference by uh, the Secretary General and the press conference by President France, they have given the kind of Philip uh, uh, that uh, captured the imagination of the larger developing world. And we were not expecting the counter from the EU after uh, the, the point that has come up uh, in our discussion today uh, in terms of how multilateralism uh, can be strengthened, and I would like to bring it very much there back on the track in terms of uh, WTO's approach on industrial policy, something that EU has been uh, uh, bringing back on the table, but neither the uh, Washington-based institutions, the World Bank, IMF, nor WTO have been supporting the idea of industrial policy. And this is where uh, collective efforts by Africa, Asia, and, uh, uh, and uh, EU would be, would be extremely important. Governance of oceans, that's another area where uh, EU has been proactively positioning itself. But you look at the uh, issues that are there in governance of Pacific or even Indian Ocean. So we need to see how Indo-Pacific, how uh, uh, ocean governance, how uh, uh, industrial policies, areas in which EU stood uh, all this while, they have to be uh, part of the global uh, imagination uh, when we are thinking of these policies. Before I close, I let me also mention here uh, the idea that that uh, that is there in terms of uh, the uh, global coherence on, on development cooperation. The, uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, we working with uh, uh, ECOSOC uh, uh, on the development cooperation forum is something where EU has been working with countries. Now, uh, to bring uh, mega groupings together uh, to, to, to do that, particularly when we are talking of localization of SDGs and when we are talking about industrial policy, wouldn't it be pertinent for us to see how uh, coherence uh, with South-South cooperation is possible? You look at uh, uh, the position that EU took on uh, 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 the uh, BAPA plus 40, the Buenos Aires Plan of Action uh, after 40 years. There was absolutely uh, no major statement from EU in terms of how they stand with South-South cooperation. OECD has taken position. OECD is talking about it. United Kingdom uh, is up with the idea of partnering with the uh, with the South for uh, uh, COP26 uh, and several Paris-related uh, uh, initiatives. I think it is important uh, uh, to see how BAPA plus 40 can be taken forward. How the UN Office on South South Cooperation or even other entities, FAO and many others, have. Uh, unleashed several programs on South-South cooperation, their impact assessment, something that EU uh, stood for in terms of impact assessment, evaluation, partnership with the South for encouraging India, China, South Africa, Brazil, uh, uh, Thailand, all have been giving, may not be of the same quantity, quantums may be small, but, but they are partnering. So how we can bring in greater coherence, I think uh, multilateralism process itself requires this. And this also goes to the way we manage financial uh, uh, architecture, the basal norms. 
debates are not settled uh, uh, in terms of how basal norms are to be addressed when it comes to multilateral financing architecture. So the regional development banks, the uh, global uh, banks like the new development bank, uh, how they have come up, what kind of role they are playing. So I think uh, a jury is still out uh, wins to see how we can really strengthen uh, some of these initiatives and programs uh, uh, when we are talking about our, uh, our engagement. And last point that I want to uh, mention what uh, 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 Chloe had mentioned in terms of uh, uh, work well better. I think it is also uh, uh, important uh, uh, as we are setting in for the new presidency. The, out of the three eyes, Italy is almost out a few months and then we are done. The two eyes have yet to enter in, Indonesia followed by India. So these three eyes have something to contribute in terms of how we see global governance. And that's where I think EU's role would be extremely important for next uh, two and a half years to see uh, how uh, an inclusive recovery can be established, how a mutually helpful vision may come up, and, and how the uh, um, uh, sort of different perspectives. You might have seen uh, uh, Germany's white paper on multilateralism, uh, which is another very interesting piece in terms of, and unfortunately, the German Development Institute uh, uh, hosted discussions and uh, uh, and uh, had a lot of discussions in terms of how Germany can address uh, 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 multilateralism. So I think uh, there are these uh, uh, possibilities, scope where AU and EU partnerships are possible, how Asian countries can connect there. So how Asia, Africa, Europe partnership may bring on table uh, as somebody in the question box has very rightly said, role of the private sector and SDG. I would emphasize on industrial policy, coherence of development, cooperation, localization of development as some of the areas where multilateralism can really help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, da Daniel, there's, there's a lot um, to unpack there for you on the, on the commission side. I ad admit I'm not totally au fait with the German paper on multilateralism, but I'm hoping it's relatively similar to your own. <laughs> uh, maybe if there were some, some key differences, uh, it, would be, it would be interesting to discuss that. But um, I wonder if you'd like to pick up any of the points that the speaker yeah, has been I making mean, so far, especially this point on, in the chat about digitalization. I think um, okay. plenty of questions about that, given we're talking about joint agendas, and when it comes to digitalization, sometimes I really feel that's an EU agenda rather than one that really resonates too strongly in, in partner countries, but I'm happy to hear uh, Thanks. You know, I think a lot has been said, so let me a, a tiny bit try to unpack, uh, not, not comprehensively, because I, I think the conversation is, is extremely rich. Um, first, maybe to, to actually echo Sachin's point about, you know, uh, EU's communication problem. I mean, I think we acknowledge it, but we also have to to be conscious that we are a very complex machinery. We are not one, and this is, let's say, our curse, but also the beauty of us in the sense that uh, when we do come together with a position, uh, we come on scale and we really make a difference and we we we, we make the conversation shift. Um, but but to get there, sometimes it takes a bit of uh, a bit of uh, a bit of time and and efforts uh, on some issues more easily, on some issues more difficulty. Uh, I have a former boss who used to say, you know, let's not forget where Europe is coming from. I mean, uh, uh, 60 something years into the into their history, uh, uh, the US had still their civil war ahead of them. Uh, we are a, a machinery that is capable to solve problems, you know, uh, by discussion, maybe not always agree. Uh, at EU level, of course, uh, our leadership has to take into account a bit the the various sensitivities, that's why they are also more cautious sometimes uh, uh, compared to, let's say, the US coming up with a big uh, uh, Jamboree statement. So that, that I think reality has to be uh, acknowledged. But yes, we are probably still uh, on a learning curve in terms of communication, but I think it's improving. And uh, that links maybe to another point with this, this Team Europe approach. That's partially also about that. This is about uh, Europe coming on scale uh, uh, to make a difference in a given area and to create a policy dialogue with the partner in question in a given area to have the kind of transformational effect um, uh, at local level linked to the SDGs. And that links to Bernardo's point about, you know, 
anchoring uh, a bit some of the abstract conversations out there uh, floating uh, to a to a comparable similar discourse and we are very much uh, I mean historically behind 2030 agenda uh, as Europe so we are of course super keen to continue co putting it uh, uh, on top uh, of uh, of the international conversation and I mean Vince knows it because he's written about it but uh, our president came out with this concept of global recovery initiative uh, that connects putting back 2030 agenda on track with the debt question that had become very very hot and sustainable investment and i think if you look at you know what is going on in the g7 g20 some of the other conversations this is the uh, uh, the essence of it uh, even if it's uh, used uh, uh, via uh, uh, via certain different terminologies. So, so, so we are very much pushing that and we are also pushing the kind of, I think, localization of the SDGs and 2030 agenda that I think uh, Sachin Bernardo were alluding to because um, I think we've learned being, let's say, also a donor, uh, a partner now for, for many, many years that ultimately, be it funding, be it policies, where they make a difference is at local level. Uh, you have lots of global conversations, but ultimately it's about things landing in countries and uh, uh, changes happening in countries. And uh, the whole setup we have ongoing is really much more geared towards uh, quality conversations at, at, at country level. At the same time, I do not think it would be fair to say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we do not support South-South cooperation. On the contrary, I mean, I think uh, we can, share a full list of uh, the, the brilliant things we've done on South South, but we're also trying to think innovatively. And I mean, I can give some examples actually where we partner uh, with uh, with India, uh, to name just India, but also many others in Africa and others. We have, for instance, the International Platform on Sustainable uh, Finance, which is uh, very much about, again, connecting to what Bernardo uh, mentioned, uh, bringing back a, a bit of a more common understanding of what it means uh, sustainability, including so as to encourage the, the private sector to come on board because for them they are a bit lost. Okay, P public uh, sector, you want us to, to be more sustainable, but <laughs> what does it mean? So uh, we have launched this platform, uh, India is on board, uh, China, many others. Uh, and I, could, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't resist jumping in on exactly this point. Yeah. How does the, that platform relate to the EU's internal sustainable finance taxonomy, which is also an attempt to answer those questions, yeah. but is very high level, very demanding to the point that some people say those standards will never be applicable in countries, in developing countries with a different energy mix. So how do, that's, a, that's why I leap in, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, no, but, but EU, I, EU standards, EU standards versus the rest of the, the world. No, I, I think it's not about the competition, but at least starting to create a conversation about something that is so primordial. And, and I think that's the philosophy behind this this platform, which is not incidentally just with with countries, but also the big institutions that drive development. So IMF, uh, 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 lots of the development banks that are there and, and, and that share, let's say, individual experiences on how this works. Uh, sometimes leading to inspiration because some might be more advanced. I think uh, we have our thinking, the Chinese have our, our, their thinking, others are still at a uh, more conceptual phase and therefore draw inspiration from it. Uh, as long as the sense of direction is, is, is a bit similar, I don't think it's necessarily immediately a big competition issue. Long term, maybe. But uh, but but we come from so far on, on on this, you know, trying to put the world back on track uh, on sustainability that, uh, that that this is needed. Another example, I mean, and that echoes, for instance, uh, uh, Daniele's point on the G20 and the Indian presidency. I mean, um, again, Europe, notably also again led by France, has been very much behind this concept of uh, uh, trying to really pull collective financing together and much of it has been uh, not sleeping but exists at, at, at the various development banks uh, out there be it local national uh, global uh, and uh, as you know uh, the french hosted the first summit on uh, the financing common summit regrouping all development banks uh, worldwide uh, 
the Italian G20 presidency now uh, uh, will host uh, another round. Uh, I think uh, from a European perspective, we are extremely keen to see, for instance, Indonesia or maybe India uh, picking up on that and, uh, and continuing in partnership with us, uh, uh, Europe. And that in a way is almost more precious than just South-South cooperation because we, we really bring uh, uh, many of us on, on board and that goes a bit more in the direction of, you know, partnerships of, of, of equals from the start. Uh, and I think you have many of those initiatives out there that, that are much more modern and I think in line with the speed pace and actually scale uh, that, um, that needs to happen for the world to transform because, um, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I get frustrated when, you know, we institutions bug down into pilots about this and that, okay. Uh, okay, we do a pilot on this and that, south-south, but what in five years we pick on that pilot uh, and and by then the, the world has moved on. Um, really now we have to, to, to come on things a bit faster and on, on scale. And finally on the digitalization very quickly because I think I'm cautious we're out of time. I think from our perspective, of course, this is a top on top of the agenda, I think it's become even more on top of the agenda given COVID and the kind of constraints uh, uh, that we have seen. What we are eager in terms of partnerships uh, uh, around it is obviously to work not just on the, let's say, infrastructure side of it, where we have a certain experience, but that we would want to, to scale up, but also on the regulatory side, because uh, uh, as I think uh, acknowledged in the chat, we have a certain uh, know-how in Europe in regulating those areas. I think our know-how and our vision is actually much more aligned with most partners in the world compared to, to the vision that the US or China might have. I mean, to give you an example, I mean, just the, the issue now that after so many years, we painfully agreed in the G7, hopefully again in the G20 of taxing the big uh, multinationals uh, of the digital era, Google, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, to their fair share. That has been a European battle, but this is a battle logically that is should be on top of the agenda of, of all developing nations because it is just not fair uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and much can be done. And I think on the regulatory side, certainly that's uh, an area where we really see potential to to develop a common vision, uh, not just at country level, because it also comes ultimately at you know what's happening in the ITU, what's happening maybe you need you need some of those uh, standard setters uh, for uh, uh, for some of this work. So, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. We've got um, four minutes to go, so perhaps Latilia and, and Chloe, we could hear from you. Chloe, I've seen you ferociously note taking throughout our speakers. Um, so, uh, so I'm, what, what, what have you got? What have you jotted down? <laughs> What's resonated for you? Well, actually, I'd like to jump in on the last point on digital in particular because I do. This is really an area where, um, which has become more and more important over the past twenty years, but particularly the past two years. Um, and I would say that that is equally true for Africa and for Europe, but there are different priorities there very much. Um, and in pretty much all of my conversations with African policymakers or, um, you know, at, at African fora, there, there's, there's a real stress on the need for, for pan-African approaches for regional integration within Africa. Um, I think that the EU does have an added value there in supporting that regional integration. Um, but there's that that when it comes to exporting EU regulatory standards, there's there's a lot more um, you know, that that is that is a little bit more questioned. GDPR is certainly seen as being a kind of global uh, best practice in terms of data protection, but um, in certain countries um, that have tried to 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 uh, adopt similar kinds of regulation, um, there have been issues with the fact that, and even within the EU, that the, the assessments have shown that it's not always, uh, you know, a hundred percent followed. But it's much more difficult in a country which has a much smaller, you know, has much smaller capacities in terms of regulation in terms of. Um, uh, following up on that. Um, so, so we need to be careful in terms of th this kind of push 
to to externalize regulation and um, and i i feel that there is there is going to be a, a big question when it comes to trying to find global standards is going to be very 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 difficult because this is one of the areas where we are more divided than ever and where the global powers while it may be possible to come to to some kind of agreement with the us it's it's very unlikely that we will come to to an agreement with china and ultimately africa needs investment from all of the global powers and is not going to uh, make an alliance with Europe that uh, puts its its investment from India or China or other other countries um, that that that, that um, undermines that. And right now, China is a much m more important uh, investor than Europe ultimately. And so, this is one of the areas where the EU really needs to scale up is in increasing investment in digital massively, um, if it wants to be a real player in terms of digital. Um, so, very quickly. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, Otilia, any closing uh, thoughts from you, please? Uh, thanks, Vince. With probably just a minute for me to speak, I'll try to be as brief as I possibly can. Um, Chloe has said it already, which is that Africa needs investment, uh, as well as inclusive development and a recognition of what those needs are. And that means from the African side, being clearer, we've, we've spoken, sorry, we've spoken about the EU's communication challenges and issues, but I think in, 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 a, in the spirit of fairness and clarity in our conversation, um, African member states and the continent also needs to be clearer about what those needs are uh, at a local, national, regional, as well as continental level. And uh, earlier, Vince, you said, uh, you know, as a throwaway comment, you said something about uh, Europe perhaps caring more about issues of digitalization than, than, than perhaps Africa would. We happen to be the continent with the greatest digital penetration because physical infrastructure has not lent itself to easing communication on the African continent. Uh, we happen to be the continent that has innovated when it comes to digital payments because traditional methods of payments have not always been easy. So perhaps we need to have a conversation, not today because I have 20 seconds left, uh, in which we speak about what Africa can also contribute and teach when it comes to certain areas, not always looking at it from a point of view where it is Europe coming into Africa uh, uh, alone. And perhaps to, to end uh, on, on that point, um, you know, in an earlier statement that I made earlier around the importance of communicating and consulting and really finding and forging uh, ways forward, we cannot ignore, uh, to put it bluntly, we cannot ignore that the world is not Africa and Europe alone. It's been said by a number of uh, uh, other speakers, but we have to be mindful of the different uh, forces at play, the different um, uh, methods used, and in all of this, we have to be mindful that for Africa still, you cannot change that we need to ensure sustainable and inclusive development, whoever the partner is. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we're now going to hear from Hurt Laporte, who's got some closing uh, remarks for us. But uh, Hurt, I'm sorry, we've, uh, we've truncated your time as well. So you now have one minute instead of two. That's okay. short. That's very short for a very rich uh, debate. I would like to thank all the participants. Maybe three points that I retain from this debate. The first one, the EU has strong positions and strong strategies on multilateralism. Uh, I think we all agree on this and um, climate, uh, the value agendas, uh, social protection, SDGs. But my second point, the reality is very different. Eh? The EU is losing weight in the multipolar world. There are competing societal models. Uh, there are more assertive partners. Uh, there's a lot of internal divisions and the EU is also quite slow. On EU Africa, it was mentioned by some of the panelists that there is a kind of uh, lack of enthusiasm, a kind of growing fatigue. Uh, why? Because we have too many strategies. We have too many repackaged uh, 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 agreements and arrangements uh, between the European Union and Africa. So what can be done about this? My third point. I think, first of all, we need to consult much more as Europeans, as European Union, 
before putting forward proposals and the ACP EU agreement, which was also mentioned as a typical example. In fact, the final outcome of that negotiation was almost the negotiating mandate of the European Union. So the consultation process should be much more qualitative. And that's also an African responsibility. It's not only a European responsibility that is not always willing to listen to the other side. On the African side, there's also a, an issue of uh, uh, incoherence that should be addressed. We should rationalize the agreements. Uh, we have too many silos. That's definitely uh, the case. Uh, but the most important, what I retain is that we should try to build a partnership beyond the traditional north-south type of deals that we have had in the past. And the win-win, the mutual interest-driven partnerships are the future. And a lot of examples were given in this meeting. And we talked a little bit about climate. We talked about digital. We did not talk migration, but also there, there is uh, something to be said about mutual interest. But we talked a lot about the vaccines. And the TRIPS waiver as a fantastic test case, a test case where we can really see whether there is a seriousness on both sides, because it's in both uh, sides' interests to make sure that we have a deal on this. And this is uh, 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 crucial uh, to, to make forward or to make progress on this. Last but not least, um, I don't think that we should be uh, too um complacent about the role of the european union the european union does not always understand at this moment the sense of urgency we risk to lose a lot of credibility and a lot of support in the global world if we don't act faster and maybe the conference on the future of europe that is ongoing can bring some uh, light in the darkness but it is absolutely needed that we stop with the competing policies the, the silos the divisions between certain member states and the EU institutions, the divisions also within the EU institutions. So the credibility there is, is really uh, essential. And then uh, allow me also to make uh, some publicity for an event that we will organize next Thursday, kind of follow up event to this event on the partnership of equals between Africa and Europe. Is this a slogan or is this reality and what can be done to give this a boost, what incentives are needed to make sure that we have a more equal partnership in the future. You're all invited Thursday, 15 hours Central European time. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Her thanks everyone for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you.